few moments. My reach all in the name of the Lord, our, our visitors as well. Good to good to see you. Been many years, some of us. Um, before we, I won't be singing any songs. I, uh, I've been told before that uh, my brother has a singing gift in the family, so we just try to keep uh, keep where we're called and gifted as much as possible. I. Uh, I stand next to Gideon in the choir sometimes, and he notices that I give him a hard time. He holds the ear next to me, and I try not to take that personally. But um, yeah, we do our best. Before we get started, I just wanted to give a, uh, give a, a short testimony. Um, on Monday um, this week, my, my wife and son were heading to a doctor's appointment, and I'm in the middle of my, uh, middle of my English class and I, and I get this phone call, and I almost didn't hear the phone because I have it on, uh, on silent, but I heard something vibrating um, back behind me, so I picked it up, and it was my wife. It's always good to pick up your wife's phone calls, no matter if you're in the middle of something else. And this time it certainly was because she and Job had just gotten in an accident. Maybe you could show the, uh, the first slide here. Um, there's, the, uh, there, there's her car. She'd gone through a uh, red light and gotten hit by a... Uh, gotten hit by another vehicle, and I was, uh, we were just glad that uh, it was just the car that was damaged. Uh, my wife didn't have any, uh, uh, she was a little bit sore for a day, but nothing bad. She often has headaches and things like that, but the Lord just really, really touched her. And so we're just uh, very thankful. You know, we, uh, we pray, watch over our families uh, when we go to work and things, and uh, it's good to see how God does, uh, does protect us. And uh, you know, I think her, her guardian angel just might have gotten a promotion this week. But we're, we're very thankful for that. But no, the other part of the testimony was uh, you know, last week, Brother Brand and I were talking about the, uh, about the used car market. We both drive old cars and things. And I said, Lord, I, I told him, I, I really pray our cars just keep on doing it for a really long time because I hear it's really hard to find a car right now. When you do find a car, People pay above the sticker price and everything. I don't like paying above the sticker prices and things like that. And then it's the very next morning, I get the phone call, your car's in trouble. Uh, so we went and got had it checked out. It was uh, totaled pretty quickly. But um, my dad, he said, oh, can I do anything to help? He, so he walked around. He went to a, a, used car, a used car lot. And he walked in the door. And right behind him uh, walked, the, walked in the owner of the uh, company, um, Tom All. Uh, this is not an advertisement, but uh, he had just been to our school a, a couple, about a month before um, giving the kids Gideon Bibles, so he knew, he, he, he knew who we were and things, and uh, he said, yeah, and just the day before, somebody had traded in a, a Dodge Caravan, low miles, great condition, um, good price, and within that same day, I went home 8 o'clock that evening with a new van, and that's what God provided. Uh, he protects and provides. And so we're just very, very grateful. My wife and I were talking that evening. We just, you know, when God takes care of you in such a way, you just feel so loved. He, he takes care of us. Well, this morning, um, um, Lord laid on my heart, uh, if I had to give it, a, give it a title, I'd call it the, the broken image. And we'll start out uh, in Genesis 127. I have it here on the slide. We can stand and we can read it. In Genesis 1.27, God, uh, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So when Adam was created, we can see he was a mirror image of God. And then when, when Eve was separated out of Adam, together they formed a mirror image of God. And if there had been, if the fall hadn't happened, and there have been many more mirror images of God populating Eden one way or the other. We know how that would have happened. But they would have been able to, humans would have been able to look at each other and say, ah, I can see God in you because we're mirror images of God. We can see God in one another. That was what the intention was. We're mirror image, we were created as a mirror image of God. Um, however, with the fall, the mirror image of God that was in them was broken. It was, it, it, it was shattered. And uh, that's the broken image. We want to talk today about that broken image and how God works to repair it and how Satan tries to keep us from getting that image repaired. You may be seated. 
and go back to the uh, PowerPoint presentation. I was thinking about a, uh, a broken image, and you know, we use, uh, well, I might use a, a mirror, and then I was driving up to and asked my wife in the car, you know, what, what day is it today? And I was thinking about uh, today is Halloween, but she corrected me. She's the more spiritual. And she said, no, it's Reformation Day. Because this is when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses. So she put me in my place there. But I was just kind of thinking about, uh, about uh, Halloween and one of the superstitions that we know. It's, uh, if you break a mirror, it's said to bring uh, seven years bad luck. I don't, uh, I don't believe in that. But I kind of thought the idea behind it, why, why do people associate that bad luck with that superstition? Well, because they, they, they look at this as a picture of you. And when this image of you is broken... That's a bad thing. And I think you can take it back, uh, this, this, this idea of a, an image being broken. It goes back to the fall, how God created man in his image. And when, that, and, that, and when that image is shattered, when that image is broken, you can try to look in the mirror again. But if there's a shattered mirror, you're not going to see a clear picture of who you are. And when that image of God within the human being was, was broken with the fall, there is no clear image of who we are when we look at one another. We can see shattered pieces. Oh yeah, there's, there's, something, of, there's something good in, the, in, in, in every human being, no matter whether they're, um, have, if they've been washed in the blood, if they're justified, sanctified, in every human being, there are, there, there are still a broken image of God and they're capable of creating things of great worth. That's why even in, in secular literature, and secular music, you can see some real kernels of truth out there because each person is made in the image of God. But it's a shattered image. And that's why we can't just focus upon, upon any one individual to be our salvation because it's a shattered image of God. So immediately though, after, after the fellowship with God was broken, the image of God was shattered with an Adam and Eve, immediately God comes down to seek his fallen children because they've lost their identity and the only place that they can see their identity clearly again is in God himself. So the image of God is shattered. They cannot look at each other and see exactly who they are. God comes down himself so they can see, ah, that's Papa God. That's where I came from. That's who I am. He, had, he wanted to come right down to reaffirm who they are, that they're his children. And we're going to find whenever God comes down to try to reaffirm who his children are, the devil's going to come right in very quickly to, 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 to hinder that. One of the... Uh, Maybe our next slide, then our next one. One of the very first of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And I think this is significant, not just because it's the second of the commandments, but I think it's significant because we're made in God's image, the image is broken, and whenever we go to try to find out who we are from another source, that's going to be an image instead of God. Only God, only by looking at God can we see a clear image of who we really are. And we can see right as God gathers the children of Israel there at Mount Sinai with the purpose of establishing a covenant with them, making clear their identity with him, making clear their relationship with him. They are his covenant, his chosen people. In his first, one of his first commandments is, Thou shalt not make any graven image. And as he's up there on the mount, one of the very first things they do is they make the graven image. And we see clearly in this situation why this is so bad. Let me hear our next slide. Psalm 135 gives, a, gives I think, a good reason for uh, why these images are bad. The idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. So it's completely illogical to worship a God that you make yourself. But the next part is the, is, is the key. They that make them are like unto them. And whenever you set up an image instead of God in our life, we're not going to become more like God. We're going to start becoming like the image that we set up. And in the book of Exodus, as soon as they, uh, they have set up this, uh, this uh, molten calf, they get up early the next morning, they offer burnt offerings and peace offerings, they get up to eat and drink, and then they rose up to play. They stopped acting like the chosen people of God, and they started acting like animals. Because they who make the image become like unto it. 
So when God wants us to be our attention completely focused on him because that's, that's the only way that we can see who we're supposed to look like because the image is broken. God wants our attention to be fully on him because as we focus upon him, as we gaze upon him and we open our hearts to his word, we become changed more and more into his image because that's where we come from. That's what he wants to restore us to. He wants to repair the broken image and and that image is repaired by focusing upon God and drawing closer to him. The devil wants to get in there, get some image in between whether it's a graven image, whether it's a mental concept, doesn't matter. Get something in between so that we'll be looking at something else besides God. Because only by looking upon God, gazing upon him, accepting him, that's the only way that the broken image within us can be restored. Idolatry carried a stiff penalty in the Old Testament. Because if you're not drawing your identity from God... You will fall for anything, and you will start acting like anything. So there was a, uh, there was a clear pen, a, a penalty in Deuteronomy 29. talks about to, if anybody starts setting up idols, turning your, your hearts away from the Lord your God to serve other nations, etc. And they'll say, when this happens, um, they might bless themselves in their heart. This is from Deuteronomy 29. And say, so I'll have peace. I'll walk in the imagination of my heart. I'll, I'll add drunkenness to thirst. The Lord won't spare them. And his name would blot it out from under heaven. It's a, it, it, it's a serious thing to reject the image of God, to reject the identity of God, and then lead other people astray in that. And then Brother Branham says, um, when Israel, this is in the Sardesian church age, when Israel rejected the leadership of God in the pillar of fire and turned to worship the golden calves, their names were removed from the book of life. And then he says, if it happened then, Most assuredly, Israel's rejection of Jesus Christ as the Messiah would demand as severe a penalty. So I want to take a look at another time. Take a look over in the book of, um, well, we'll we'll, we'll be thinking more about Matthew now. When, When Jesus Christ comes as the Messiah, here he's coming God in flesh. If there's any way that we can see who we are, who we are supposed to be, who we are made to be, it is in the ministry of Jesus Christ. God in flesh. This is, what, this is what God's will was at the beginning. But very quickly, whenever God is bringing forth a clear image of himself for us to focus on, become connected with, so that we can be restored and our broken image can be repaired, whenever that happens, the devil is going to come in with another image for us to look at. Now in the book of Exodus, we see this as a physical, graven image. In the um, in, in the Gospels, we, see, we don't see the scribes and Pharisees erecting statues that we should be worshiping as of Jehovah. We don't see a graven image. But we do see images um, that they have in their own conceptions of how God would work, in their own doctrine, and those become the image that they seek after. It's so important not to take anything else but just what God is, because when you make an image, whether it be a grave, whether it be a graven image in the Old Testament, you look in the, all the old pagan literature, they have all these gods and goddesses. Uh, the gods and goddesses they create, they're more like humans. They're nothing more. You can't, you can't go beyond them and become more godlike. They, they, you, be, you become more depraved. But when you take a look, though, in the, old, in, the, um, in the New Testament, as Jesus comes, the Messiah comes, fulfilling all the Old Testament scriptures. The scribes and Pharisees refuse to accept it. And it's interesting, the things, maybe we could just look over um, in Psalm 69. I, mentioned, I said, Matthew, we're going to look at Psalm 69. This is a, a messianic psalm, and uh, David uh, makes many statements about the Messiah here that, uh, that Jesus ends up accepting or quoting about, speaking about himself. As you're turning, I think it's interesting when we look, uh, when Jesus comes as the Messiah, some of the things that happened around Israel at that time. I didn't realize, but the, 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 the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they were two very, very different groups within Judaism. Actually, about the hundred years before, before Jesus was born, there was, a, there was a Jewish civil war, and the Sadducees and the Pharisees were on opposite sides. They were fighting a civil war. The Sadducees were more associated with the Greeks, and they wanted to Hellenize, make, it more, make Jewish more like the Greek religion. And the Pharisees wanted to know, keep it simple, keep it back 
uh, the traditions of Moses, and they fought a war about this thing. But when they, what's the one thing that could, could, could unite these two groups in the spirit of bipartisanship? It was their rejection of Jesus. People who had great enmity would never work together, but when, when Jesus comes and the Messiah comes, it brings these two groups together. Um, so when, when the Messiah comes here, let's just take a look at Psalm 69, and we'll just uh, pick out a couple of scriptures here. Um, verse 8, a couple, of, a couple of scriptures that we can easily identify with Jesus. I am become estranged to my brethren, an alien to my mother's children. Here, this is a case where this is one that clearly can be identified with Jesus. Um, he says, verse 9, The zeal of your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Jesus quotes the scripture as he's going through the temple and cleaning it of the money changers. Um, let's see here. Let's take a look down at verse 20. Reproach hath broken my heart. I am full of heaviness, and I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. Then they gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. This is, this is fulfilled there on the cross. Verse 22, let their table become a snare before them, and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. And this is a scripture that, that really... Um, I'd never seen it before in this light until we were teaching a Sunday school class a couple weeks ago. And we were, as we were reading this in the Sunday school class, it, it opened up to me like it hadn't before. Let their table become a snare before them. Their table, this is where the Torah would have been. This is their, their conception of how God should be coming. We want God to come and throw off this Roman yoke. God has to come our particular way. This is what, what we, this is, this is, this is the, the, this is, the, this is our, grave, our, 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 our graven image, as it were, how God has to work. But when they reject truth, when Jesus comes and he fulfills all those scriptures, the thing that had been a help to them, this table with the Torah, the scrolls, they had the, their table had been a help, had been a guide for showing what God's will was. But when you reject truth, the same thing that had been for your good for so many years, for centuries it had been for their good, it now became a snare, a trap for them. This word of God, the law, the Torah, had been for their welfare. But when they refuse the fulfillment of it, it becomes a trap. Because they think we've got it, this Jesus, he's not it at all, and they're going to, they're going to just, uh, they're going to, uh, the Dutch have an expression when you're having a, a, an argument, you're going to keep your legs stiff. I'm not going to bend at all. And this is what, what happened here. The things that they had, had held dear for so long had fought wars over. They'd confessed uh, uh, Jehovah's name for so long. Yet now when they refuse truth when it's open before them, the very things that they'd held dear that were God's word becomes a trap and a snare to them because they are now drawing their identity from something besides God's revealed word. God comes down in flesh. This is who you're supposed to be. Here I am, Jesus says. I am he. He comes down in this way, and the devil comes right with him at the same time to give them something else. No, you don't want this. Hold on to this interpretation of the truth and they, they turn away from, that, from the God's revealed word to what they thought was true, and what they had had becomes a trap and a snare for them. When you look at, um, if you follow Paul and Barnabas through the, through the book of Acts on their missionary journeys, now we remember when we take, uh, whenever we take a, whenever we erect a, a graven image, we become like unto it. And when um, one of the amazing things that happens as, as uh, Jesus is going to be crucified, God has provided them with a king, a king very different than what they had wanted or expected, but God provided a king. Well, in John 19, 15, as the Jews are betraying Jesus now to Pilate, they shout with all their hearts, we have no king but Caesar, as they reject what God has provided for them, as they reject that, they're making a full-hearted acceptance 
of the bondage that they had actually wanted to be freed from. They'd want to deliver from that bondage. When you reject, when you reject God's revealed truth, everything that you had had becomes a snare to you, and you're making it an open-hearted acceptance of bondage. And they think they're doing right the whole time. Now, Paul and Barnabas, we can look at um, Acts 13. Whenever uh, Paul and Barnabas are traveling through Asia Minor, they, for a while they have a, uh, up to this point, I, I believe, there's a, there's a pattern they follow. Whether they go there in Cyprus or in Asia Minor, they first go to the synagogues because God, God had worked with the Jews first. Before we start working with the Gentiles, we'll go to the Jews first. And every time they, got, they started getting put out of the synagogues after a while. In Acts 13, we see the Jews now, they have a likeness that they have erected of how God should work. It is different from God's uh, fulfillment in, 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 in Jesus. And we're going to see them becoming like unto the image that they've erected. Acts 13.45 when the Jews saw the multitudes of Gentiles who were following Paul and Barnabas, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Now, now the Jews are acting like the very image that they erected. They reject the image of God. They take on the image of Caesar. Caesar is our king, and that starts affecting how they live. They don't want anything to do with these people who are actually teaching from the law, the truth, from the Torah, taking them beyond that. They don't want anything to do with that. And they're crying out as hard against... They they persecute Paul and Barnabas, just like they had been persecuted by Greeks and Romans earlier. But when you reject God's revealed truth, take on another image, you're going to become like that image. Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And from that point on, the, 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 the pattern changes when they go to cities. They don't always go to the synagogues first. They start going to the Gentiles. They had um, taken something else. The Jews had taken something else as their image, and they became like it. Brother Branham says, uh, you know, God doesn't send anybody to hell. You send yourself to hell. God, e- God erects barrier after barrier. He sends the truth to you. And every time that we step over that, God's not sending us to hell. God's not sending judgment in our lives. It is we who are taking that choice. Whenever we take a, the, the, whenever the devil gives us a, a temptation, he's giving us one end of the stick. It looks very attractive, very beautiful. But we can't separate the end that the devil shows us from the end that's in his hand. Because it's very tempting, it's out there, we want to grab that. But the judgments, the, the difficulties that come with it are connected there at the other end of the stick. The, and that can't be separated. Now as, uh, as Paul continues his uh, journeyings, many different people start working with him. But um, maybe we can turn over to 2 Timothy. One of these men was Demas. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we don't know a whole lot about Demas' um, testimony. What we do know, though, is he worked uh, well with Paul uh, for a time. But uh, at some point, um, Demas started getting his eyes off of what God was doing and the world to come and the gospel that was being preached. And he got his eyes on this present world. And 2 Timothy 4.10 says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. That's such a sad thing, because Demas was working with the Apostle Paul. God was clearly working through the Apostle Paul's ministry, doing a a great and mighty work. But how easy it is, even then, when we're so close to truth that's being revealed, how the, the one that God's working with, we can still have our vision clouded. We don't know... Whether there was a disagreement with Paul, they think he got his toes stepped on at some point, or maybe he got flattered, thinking I should be getting some more attention. Maybe he just, maybe he just wanted uh, wanted more money. We we don't know what it was, but one way or the other, got his eyes off what God was doing, got his eyes on the present world, and there went a desire out for that. And that's a sad thing. I want to spend a little bit more time uh, looking more at what what the Antichrist, what the devil tries to do 
even in this end time. As God, um, we, we can take a look in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, see how, how, the, how the church started out. And it's very clear God's working in a, in a supernatural, marvelous way. Uh, the Holy Spirit's being poured out. It's, it's just amazing. But if you compare the book of Acts with the description of the church that's given in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3 in the church ages, there's a very big difference between the book of Acts and how the church became over the succeeding centuries. Very big difference. And we see it some, somehow, um, somewhere, the church started perhaps getting their eyes off of God, started looking around and becoming more and more like the world. Uh, Brother Bram talks about how the church was very similar to what, how Israel was back in the days of Samuel, how they wanted a king. They wanted to be like the nations round about them. When they do that, they're getting their eyes off of what God is. God is their king. They start getting their eyes off of him, looking at the other nations around them, and they want something more like that. So in the, in, in, in the day that we live in now, God has shown what the Son of God looks like. He worked mightily in Brother Branham's ministry and the ministry of many others, but he worked mightily in this way to do a restoration. And I just want to... I want to assert here that the Antichrist is offering today, if you look at pop culture and popular religion, the Antichrist is offering a substitute image for the church to identify with. The Bible gives us a clear image of Christ, the, 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 the gospel that Paul preached. We want to be looking at that. As we look at that, we'll become more and more like that, and the broken, the shattered image within us will be repaired. The devil wants to do anything and everything he can to get our eyes off of this truth, get us to look at anything else so that that broken image within us can't be repaired. His goal, though, he knows how we're made. He knows that we need, there, there, there's a need for something bigger than ourselves. There's a need for the sense of the religious, for the sense of the spiritual. So he does offer religion today. He helps men scratch their spiritual itch. He wants to do anything to keep that quiet enough so that they don't reach out to Christ. He's doing everything that he can to keep us from spying our true identity, which can only be found in the word of God. Now, in um, kind of looking at how, how, how the devil would be working in our day, in the 20th century, the 21st century now, I read a, a quote a few years ago by a man named William Booth, and he was the founder of the Salvation Army. He was a uh, we can have it on the slide here. There he is. He almost looks uh, like those pictures. He looks like an old prophet almost. But he, as he's at the beginning of the 20th century, he's writing. He says, the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without without hell. I read this, and my, he describes our world today to a T. The devil has done everything he can to give you religion without God, religion without the Holy Ghost, give you Christianity without Christ. Because if you have Christ in the picture and you're looking at Christ, you're going to become more like him. But he wanted to give us a sense that we're worshiping Christ without ever knowing the real one. Want to give us a sense of spirituality. The devil's not against spirituality. He's for spirituality. He's not against that. He wants to encourage spirituality, to turn you aside from truth, from the Bible, that when God came down, set his two feet on earth in the body of Jesus Christ, that's who we should be identifying with. The devil wants to take that completely out, let you feel spiritual, but not have this. And what we have described, if you look at the... Uh, the next slide. This is a picture from, uh, from uh, Pilgrim's Progress. This is when, 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 when Pilgrim is carrying his, his burden there on his back. If you're not familiar with Pilgrim's Progress, it's a really good thing. You should have your, your kids read it at some point. There's great uh, can, children's versions you can get for upper elementary, junior high versions, high schools. You can read the full thing. It's a great book, highly recommended. But here you got Pilgrim with his, with his burden of sitting on his back. And the evangelist just told him, you've got to go 
go through that wicket, yonder wicket gate, that there's one way to get that off your path, and, and the door, the gate, is Jesus Christ. You have to go through that gate, and as he's going, he makes it the gate, as he's going, he's, he's, he's heading to an area that's going to be the cross at some point, but he meets this man along the road named Worldly Wise Man. A worldly wise man says, no, you don't have to go that way, that's way too hard. You need to go over this way. I've got a nephew, a cousin in this little town called Legality. His name is Mr. Civility, and he can get that burden off your back in no time, not so long a journey, pain-free, and you'll be able to settle nicely here. Legality and civility. And he, a Christian goes along this way. It sounds nice, but um, shortly, long, shortly long, along the path, he comes, in the, um, he, he comes by this mountain of the law, because we can do all these things in our own minds. We can, take, we can, we can try to be nice people, and we can, try to, we, we can try to follow the law of God the best we can, but it doesn't always sate the conscience inside of us. And he, Pilgrim goes along Mount Sinai, and there's this typing the law of God, and he's feeling, I'm, I'm going to be condemned. This is not good. I'm going to be, the death is upon me. And fortunately, evangelist comes just in the nick of time. And evangelist does not speak nicely to a Christian. He rakes him over the coals. I mean, if Christian were to be offended, this is the place where he would get offended. But he says, what worldly wise man has preached to you, with all of his kind-sounding kind words, he sounds so nice. What he has done, he, he has tried to take the cross out of your experience. And any, any, any kind of spirituality or, or religion that takes the cross, the blood, Jesus Christ out of your religion, out of your experience with God, it does a disservice to you, and that should be offensive to us. Because it sounds so nice, what worldly wise men said, civility, this is a place with nice people. Who wants to live with nice people? Yes, we all do. But if they're not, if, they're, if they haven't met Jesus Christ, if they haven't, if they haven't seen, met, met the cross, been filled with the Holy Ghost, you won't be helped there. You might feel good there sometimes, but Christ didn't come to make us feel good. Christ didn't come to make us nice people. Christ came for dead people to be made alive. If you go to the doctor and go to get surgery done, I'm not looking forward to having surgeries done. You're going to get shots. You're going to get cut. You're going to be, have things done to you that are not nice. But those things have to be done to get work on the inside. If you, have, if you want your heart to be changed, open heart surgery, they take this saw and they cut through your sternum. They might break some ribs because something in your heart needs changed. It's not nice. This doctor's come up with this saw. Doctor, I want a nice doctor. No. You've got to have a doctor who's willing to do what needs to be done. And a worldly wise man isn't that doctor. Well, in 2005, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill did a, a study of youth and religion, and they studied the religious beliefs held by American teenagers, and they conducted over 3,000 interviews. That's a lot, uh, a lot of people to talk to. I'm, just, I'm thinking here, they're talking to folks who were teenagers in 2005. If they were 15 in 2005, they're going to be in their 30s now. So um, it says, we'll, we'll just kind of see what they have to say about them. But the dominant faith posture among American teenagers, and indeed the culture at large, the doctor, the, um, the, the research is summarized as moralistic, therapeutic deism. It says this is the, this is the general religion of uh, teenagers today and of our culture today. I just want to spend a little bit um, reading, re re reading about this, because we're at a time when we remember, we have a broken image of God inside of us that all of us do. And God wants to repair the broken image. The only way for that broken image to be repaired is for us to, to gaze upon the image of Christ, focus upon that. And anything that tries to come between us and the true image of God, it'll be another image, but it's going to keep us from, being, from knowing who we truly are. And this moralistic therapeutic deism, this describes the church today. And if we're not careful, it'll get in our homes, how we even tell our Bible stories, how we tell our kids what it means to serve God. It's not always a happily ever after ending in every single area of our life. We need to prepare, it, it, can, it can affect us. 
Let me next slide. Moralistic therapeutic deism. What is it? Well, as five main, uh, main tenets or five laws about it. First, the idea of God made the world and the watches over it. Um, God's main purpose for us, he wants us to be nice, he wants us to be good and fair. His main purpose for us, according to moralistic, therapeutic deism, he wants us to be happy and feel good about ourselves. And this is, we, we want this as well, that you can have something that's, that is, that, that is good, but if it misses other things that are true, the thing that you're being given is not a good thing. Right. Nice people will live happily ever after. There is an afterlife, and if you're nice and good in this world, you'll live happily ever after. And lastly, God does exist, but he's cool with giving you your space. He'll be there if you want him to be there, but otherwise, he's hands off. Do your own thing. Just be nice to everybody. This is kind of a summary of moralistic, therapeutic deism. And one author says that in a very real sense, um, this idea of being nice, kind, pleasant, respectful, responsible, working on self-improvement, taking care of your health, trying to be a successful person, this sounds nice. We want this. And in a very real sense, this appears to be true of a genuine faith commitment as well. But insofar as this can be described as a faith commitment... This is held by a large percentage of Americans. These individuals, whatever their age, believe that religion should be centered in being nice. So whenever you try to take a stand for something, taking a stand for anything is not going to be nice. So it kind of anything goes. So it's moralistic in the sense that you have you got to be you got to give a general framework of what does nice behavior look like. But it's therapeutic, it wants to give therapeutic benefits to its adherents. This is not a religion, the researchers explained, of repentance from sin or of keeping the Sabbath or of living as a servant of, the, of, of, of a sovereign God. This is not a religion about saying prayers or observing holy days or building character through suffering or of basking God's love and grace. Um, this is more a religion of spending yourself in gratitude for the cause of social justice. Um, it's about feeling good. The dominant religion among U.S. teenagers is centrally about feeling good, happy, secure, and peace. And this is the dominant religion in 2005 among teenagers. That means these are our 30-year-olds um, today. It's about attaining subjective well-being, being able to resolve problems, getting along amiably with other people. It's uh, just being nice. Next slide. says, God is something like a combination of the divine butler and the cosmic therapist. He's always on call, takes care of any problems that arise, professionally helps his people feel better about themselves, and does not become too personally involved in the process. This is the, this is the God, the image of God, that most people will carry today. And there is not a church of moralistic therapeutic deism. There's no denomination of that. But the authors have kind of described this. Um, this is a, more of a dominant civil religion. And they don't have their own church, but they're almost colonizing the existing churches. More and more people come to church saying these kinds of things that do sound nice. But if you believe this without believing the cross, without believing Christ, without believing the death, the resurrection, he's in the need for the Holy Spirit, you're saying some things that will sound, you might sound like you're saying the same thing as a true believer sometimes. Right. But you aren't. But, but, but you aren't. Right. And it's, this, is, this, is, this is a dangerous thing because the devil is giving us another image to be looking at and that's going to keep the image of God within us from being repaired. The authors of this study argue that this distortion of Christianity has taken root not only in the minds of individuals, but also in the structures of at least some Christian organizations and institutions. How can you tell? The language and the experience of holiness, sin, grace, justification, sanctification, heaven, hell. Those things aren't often talked about. It's about being nice communion with God, having good feelings. Being moralistic, we're supposed to be good people, supposed to feel good about ourselves, and we're supposed to have some honor to, to, to God. Instead of talking of these things, the, the doctrines of the Bible, it's been 
These things have been supplanted by the language of happiness, niceness. And if you're nice, you'll have some heavenly reward there at the end. In this therapeutic age, human problems are reduced to pathologies in need of a treatment plan. Sin is excluded from the picture. And if you don't diagnose the problem right, you won't deal with the sickness. Sins excluded from the picture, doctrines like the wrath of God or the justice of God are discarded out of step with the times and unhelpful to the project of self-actualization. But we're not supposed to be self-actualized. We're supposed to be God-actualized. But when we have a picture like this in front of us, we want to become like this that is going to hinder the repair of the broken image of God inside of us. When you think about um, this is the image of God that is preached in many churches throughout the country, many places. So even, when we're, even though we're made in the image of God, the religious being that's offered in most churches is one where God of the God of the Bible is largely absent. That means there's no real mirror for us to see who we actually are. Just kind of think about it. In the Dark Ages, how did the devil do this? He did it by doing the whole church service in Latin. And now, in our society today, we have Bibles. Everywhere you can get Bibles. You can get Bibles anywhere. You used to be thrown in jail for smuggling them. Now you can get them. You, can have, you, can have, you have a dozen Bibles, perhaps, in your own house. You can have it on your telephone. You can have it on any device. You have them all over the place. But he's deceiving us, thinking that this is the God of the Bible when it's not. So there's no mirror for us now to see. There is, but we're not using it. There's no mirror for us to see who we actually are, so we're going to believe we are whoever the devil tells us we are. And I just think that this, if you look at many of the news stories and some of the controversial issues in our day-to-day, it has to do with teenagers especially, but folks of all ages, having an identity crisis. Who am I? Am I a boy? Am I a girl? Am I some combination between? Am I going from one? What, what is this? Why do we have this, this huge identity crisis? Well, the image of God has been shattered within us. And now the, the Bible that tells us who we are, who we're made to be, has been sub- the, the, the mirror's been put aside. We're given, you are whoever you're happy feeling you are. And that's a moving target. Because one day you'll feel happy one way, another day you'll feel happy another way. There is no real basis for who you are because the image of God has been shattered and our reference point for who we are, the God in the Bible, has been pushed aside. It's here, though. We can look at the Word of God. We can be changed more and more daily into His image. We have to look at it and not take any substitute from the devil. Now, the book of Revelation talks about uh, the Bride of Christ being clothed in white robes, um, robes of righteousness. And I just want to ask, how is the modern church ever going to have such clothing if a religion without the cross is being preached? If a religion without the blood is being preached? A religion without the Holy Ghost is being preached? Repentance is not a fun, feel-good process, but it's very, very necessary. And if you're saying, and as William Booth said in this, uh, in this 20th century, he's thinking there's going to be forgiveness without repentance. I'm sorry, but there is no forgiveness without repentance. It's not, it's not possible. And if you're being told you'll be fine, it'll be just fine, but if you're not ever going through and repenting, it's not fine. If there's salvation without regeneration, where a regeneration is a work of the Holy Spirit, where, yes, you come just as you are, but you don't leave just as you were. If you leave just as you were, you didn't meet anybody there at the altar. So William Booth is saying, this coming century, there'll be a great danger. People will be thinking they have been forgiven, but without having any repentance, they'll think they're saved without being regenerated. That's a lie, a complete lie. And if this is the kind of thing that's being preached... How will, they ever, how, will, how will a church ever be clothed with robes of righteousness? Moralistic, therapeutic deism does not clear spots, wrinkles, and such things. 
from your clothes. It does not uh, let you be holy without blemish. There's only one way for that, and that's for the blood of Jesus Christ to come and flow over us, for us to be washed by the water of his word, or his word, with his anointing is being preached week in, week out, where we're fellowshipping not just around the word, but in the spirit of the word, with revelation of God. That's the only way, the only way for the bride of Christ to be clothed in white robes. Now, there are many voices in the church world. Um, I'm by far not the only one. Um, many voices in, in the church world who diagnose the problems with moralistic, therapeutic deism. And they're very good at diagnosing it, much better than I am, uh, much better at describing what's, what's, what's wrong with it. But I, 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 I'm going to suggest they're better at diagnosing than, than treating. So this moralistic, therapeutic deism um, was published in a, was described in a book written in 2005. Um, in 2010, however, maybe we could take a look at our next slide. An evangelical pastor named David Platt, he published a book called Radical, Taking Back Your Faith from the American Dream. And in his book, he, critis- he critiques the church for becoming like a corporation. This uh, church, Inc., offers all kinds of benefits, social centers, daycare, entertainment, a consumer version of Christianity. And all these churches, they compete for the local market share. And many Christians are simply pursuing a spiritualized version of their worldly goals. And one of the, uh, one of the pictures, along with uh, Platt's book, his diagnosis it says, we are not worshiping the Jesus of the Bible. He's right. He's right. The American dream has taken over um, the church at large. He gives a good diagnosis here. His, his treatment, though, his solution, is that we should surrender our materialistic dreams. I can say amen to that. If we were to, 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 to spend less and, 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 and give more to... Uh, and our tithes and offerings, give more to charities, give more to other, other, other ways of helping the needs in the world. That's a great thing. He's suggesting do more mission projects in the uh, third world. Um, live on, a, live, uh, live on a, a percentage of your income. Give away a much larger percentage of it. This, this, is, this is a great thing. This will be killing the American dream within us. There are great goals that he sets. So there's nothing to be said against them. We'd be doing do a lot better if we lived on less and gave our surplus to good causes. But I'd say, even though he diagnoses this really well, his idea of living on less and giving more doesn't really restore a church who's held the doctrines of Balaam, who've gone into Jezebel religion, and who's believed all kinds of things that are not true about God and the Bible. He gives a good diagnosis, and it would be good if we spent less and gave more. But we need something other than what he's prescribing. What God prescribes, God, God looks at the very same situation. If you read Revelation chapter 3, when he looks at the Laodicean church age, God is describing the very same things that these, these, these evangelical pastors would be describing. This, is, this, 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 this last stage church is going off the rails. People are, are catching it, they're diagnosing it. But God's, gives God's description, God's diagnosis, God's treatment is different. In Revelation chapter 3, he says, anoint your eyes with eye salve. If you look at Revelation chapter 3, Re- Revelation chapter 2, this is not a church that needs to give less or spend less and give more. It's a church who needs to be restored back to what the church was at the beginning. This is a, th- that is God's uh, treatment plan, if we were to call it such. So even though Platt's, um, Platt's treatment plan might be a, uh, different than what, what God's was. Some of the things that he says in this book, I, I came across this first in the New York Times book review years back, but um, this, this sentence I just uh, wowed me. He says, when we gather in our church building to sing and lift up our hands in worship, we may not actually be worshiping the Jesus of the Bible. Instead, we may be worshiping ourselves. We may be worshiping ourselves, he says. And I get to thinking, I always heard there's only two choices on this shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. When we please self, who are we really pleasing? It's, 
I can think back to Isaiah, Isaiah 7 or 14, I forget which, but Satan, uh, Lucifer wants to exalt himself above the stars of God. He wants to be like the Most High. He's the first one who worships self. And whenever we take that spirit upon ourselves, we want what we want. I'm going to worship myself. Whenever we take that spirit upon us, we're not worshiping ourselves. It's really a nice-looking version of worshiping Lucifer. And if you look at what he's saying in the church building, singing and lifting our hands in worship, you may not actually be worshiping Jesus of the Bible, but worshiping ourselves. And when I read this for the first time, it made me go back and think of a... Uh, a quote that Brother Branham, I, I'd heard of Brother Branham quoted many times. And you can be honest, as a teenager when, I'd heard the, when I would hear this quoted, I kind of had a problem with it. I didn't get it. How is it possible for people, Brother Branham says, you'd be worshiping the devil thinking you were worshiping God. How is that possible? But if you look around us, it's happening. Let's go to our next slide. This is the message, Satan Eden, Satan's Eden. The God of this world today, the worshipped person of this world today is Satan. And the people are ignorant of worshipping Satan, but it's Satan impersonating himself as the church. See, as the church, they worship Satan, thinking they're worshipping God through the church. And I had a hard time getting this. But you know what? He's, he's preaching this in 1965. I was hearing it in the 1990s. And I'm processing it, then things have gotten so much worse. So much worse. And you can see the shoe fits. The shoe fits. And what we need today, we don't need somebody to tell us how good we are, help us feel good about ourselves. We need a prophet to come out of the wilderness and say, This is what's wrong with you. This is God's solution. Wake up. We need somebody. You know, they we were teaching in Sunday school class about the wise and foolish virgins last week. In Matthew 25, it says all ten of them were asleep. All of them were asleep. So lest wise virgins start feeling good, I'm the, I'm, I'm the good one. No, none of us are, because all of them were asleep. And when you have to wake somebody up, I have to do it to my kids uh, in, in, in the morning, getting ready for school. You're not a nice person when you wake somebody up in the morning. You're not. <laughs> I had, uh, we had uh, uh, fire, uh, a firefighter come to school this past week and talk about fire safety with the kids. And uh, he's talking about well, if, if, if the fire alarm goes off and if the smoke alarm goes off in your house, what are you supposed to do? You get out, and you stay out. Where are you supposed to go? You have to go to your place of safety, everything. And he's talking about with these kids. And he's the, he's the fire inspector. He's, this, this is his thing. He goes through schools, teaches about it. He says, you know, kids, you should be having... You should be having fire drills in your homes several times a year. You should be doing that so that if there's a fire happens, you need to be ready, knowing exactly what to do. He says, my wife, Mrs. Myers, she doesn't like when I do fire drills because I do fire drills at 6 in the morning and 11 at night. But, ah, wow, this is not a nice guy. Making everybody, the thing's going off 6 in the morning, beep, beep, beep. Not nice. But he's seeing value. Most fires happen when everybody's asleep. I want to get my folks up and out. I don't care if my kids are crying, if my wife's upset with me. I want them out. That's what we need. That's what we need. Next slide. Satan is good at misconstruing parts of Scripture that applies to the day. He'll let you know all that Moses did was perfectly well. The scribes and Pharisees had that. What Moses did was Perfect. It was great. But when they, re when they rejected Jesus Christ, the table that had been for their benefit became made a snare, became a trap. When you take the promises that they gave for this day and then apply it to another age, that's what the devil's good at, misapplying it. That's all he has to do, see, is to get the people to believe it that way, and that's all. He doesn't have to translate the Bible into Latin. He doesn't have to block the app in the whole country. He just has to get you to think, this isn't for me. <laughs> He's accomplished his goal then. He says, people ignorantly worship Satan, thinking they're worshiping God. And I think that's, what, that's the case we see in the time that we live. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's see here. This is the next slide. Paul writes here, let no man deceive you by any means. Actually, I'll read verses 1 and 2 also. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, by our gathering together with him, 
that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as at the day of Christ is at hand. It's not yet, Paul says. One of, the re- one of the signs of his coming will be this, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that's worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And here we have it being set up where Satan is being seated enthroned in the church. People are worshiping him, thinking that, it's, that they're worshiping God. Now, the book of Revelation describes um, clearly an attempt of the devil to substitute another image for the image of God. And maybe we can turn over to Revelation chapter 13. Now, in Jesus' day, there was a, a large group of Jews who would uh, been following Moses, or who were religious. And the church age book, Brother Branham says, as Israel, the chosen people of God in majority, when they rejected Jesus, they forfeited their rights in the book of life. And he also says, then so also will the majority of the Gentile church come into condemnation with the resultant removal of their name from the book of life by rejecting the word and thereby entering into the world ecumenical movement, which is the image erected to the beast. And that's, when I read that statement uh, a month or two ago, I was, well, that's a huge statement. The majority of the names, of the, the majority of the Gentile church have their names removed from the book of life. But think about the majority of the Gentile church. What's being preached? If it's moralistic, therapeutic deism, there's nothing there that'll let your robe be white and righteous. There's nothing there that'll do that for you. Uh, Next slide, Revelation 13. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. He exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And uh, Brother Branham commenting about the scripture says, it's another beast coming out of the earth, and he has two horns like a lamb. Go back a slide, maybe. Again, yeah. Another one? There we go. Um, now, if we hadn't seen what a buffalo was, this is a, these are baby buffaloes. But if you could put yourself in John's position, what would you call these animals? Yeah, is it a cow? Is it a, what is it exactly? So he says, yeah, like a, like a lamb. Next, and you can see, next slide, so you can see who it is. There's this, uh, you see, by looking at the parent, you see who the identity is. Go on then. And Brother Branham says, this, this creature, next slide, like a lamb coming out of the earth, this unpopulated region. The sea is filled with multitudes of people, but this buffalo comes, this, this la- animal comes up out of the, he says, out of the United States. This was, this, was the, this was the last frontier, as it were. And it speaks of another beast coming up out of the earth who's going to succeed in making an image to the beast that everyone in the world would worship. And I just want to, uh, this, is, this is not new news, but about 10 or 11 years ago, Pope Francis, um, he's been exceptionally effective in expanding the ecumenical movement. He's making inroads in all, kinds of, in all kinds of churches, especially among American charismatics. But um, in February 2010, he spoke to Kenneth Copeland's Word of Faith Ministries. Next slide. And he speaks by, uh, by iPhone. And he says, let's each give each other a spiritual hug and let God complete the work that he has begun, a work of unifying us all together. And uh, Kenneth, uh, Kenneth Copeland, all these other men and women, they thought this was just a, a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. And the Ameri- an, an Anglican uh, bishop, uh, before he plays this video message, uh, this uh, Bishop Palmer speaks to the crowd and says, when my wife saw that she could be Catholic and charismatic and evangelical and Pentecostal, and it was absolutely accepting the Catholic Church, she said she'd like to reconnect her roots with the Catholic Church. So she did. And this is what the book of Revelation talks about. So, are the, so is the mother, 
So are the daughters. They're coming back together. And the crowd cheered. And Palmer continues, brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over, is yours. And Kenneth Copeland, after he, uh, after, next slide, after they have this, 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 this gathering, his comment on this was, heaven is thrilled over this. You know what is so thrilling to me? When we went into the ministry 47 years ago, this was impossible. And if you look at what happened in Jesus' ministry around the crucifixion, people who were at odds with one another were unified in their condemnation of, of, of Christ. Pilate and Herod, they were political enemies. But in getting together to condemn Christ, John says they became friends. Jesus unified them. The Sadducees and the Pharisees, they'd been at each other's throats. If you watch The Chosen, that's kind of alluded to. These groups of the Pharisees who don't get along, all these politicking, that, 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 that's alluded to. But Jesus brought them all together. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, all these different groups came together and they joined to condemn Jesus. And Matthew 13 says that before the rapture will take place, there will be a gathering. And here we see um, a gathering of many, many tears back to the Roman system. And uh, Pope Francis, we don't know... Uh, how long he'll be pope or what not. But he's done a really good job at gathering people together. First was with the, the, the Waldensians, a group in Italy that the Catholic Church had just martyred and persecuted terribly in the Middle Ages. But he went to, a, to, a, to, to, to apologize for that and, uh, and to draw them back together. The Lutherans, that was, if there was ever a big break with Rome, that would be it. But many Lutheran denominations have renewed ties with the Vatican, Pentecostals, Charismatics. And if you look about, this is, a, this is a pope who's all about gathering people in. I mean, this pope writes encyclicals, not just about doctrinal matters, but about climate change. He's, he's associating himself with every woke, popular cause. This is a man, this is, a, this is an office who will be gathering people together. And what's going to be happening, Brother Bram talks about in the message, Christ is the mystery, this will be an, or, an organize, organize a great ecumenical association of ministers to make an image to the beast, as the Bible said. There'll be a lot of people who might not go and worship there in the Vatican. They'll be worshiping in their own churches. But they've, had, they've made an image to the beast in their, in their Protestant churches, which brings the worship back to the beast himself. What shall we do with Jesus? Brother Bram says, today the Protestants are throwing themselves together in the ecumenical council, doing the same thing, grafting in tradition of man instead of taking the word of God, which is thoroughly identified by the Holy Ghost. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The church stands in the balance today and is found wanting. You're back in Pilate's judgment hall. Yes, sir. What does it do? It's making an image to the beast. It's a satellite to Rome. When the ecumenical council is forcing and will force every Protestant denomination to do it. And he says, what is it? Protestant harlots with the old mother Rome, the great whore. These Protestant denominations who do that. What do we need today? I would say that we need the wake-up call of Matthew 25. We look in Revelation chapter 3. I'm closing here, so if you want to come, you're welcome to. Verse 14, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the amen, the faithful true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, if thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou were cold or hot. The Laodicean church, I would say, is nice. Nice isn't hot, not nice, not cold. It's just nice water. That's what the Laodicean church is. So then because you are lukewarm, just nice not on fire for God, just nice. I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich and increased with goods, have need of nothing, I'm exercising the American dream, fulfilling the American dream in my church. Because you think you, you feel good about yourself, you think, you think you're great, you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. What's his advice? I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich, true riches, white raiment, that you'll be clothed, that the shame of your naked does not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. That eye salve is what we need. Yes. And it can be, I understand, um, putting on a, a tape Brother Branham sometimes, that can be a hard voice. 
It can, it, it can rub against the grain. It can make you feel uncomfortable sometimes. That's what we need. And I would just encourage you, take a look. at, <laughs> Make time for God. Make time to play a, to play a tape. Make time to read a message. Because you know what? We ask, just like the scribes and Pharisees, they had their idea of what they want, how they wanted God to come. They wanted him to come on a white charger, knocking the heads of all the Romans off. And sometimes we wish, perhaps people would wish, that God would have sent a theologian who could give a well-reasoned explanation of this or that. God didn't send a theologian. God sent a prophet. He sent a prophet with an anointing, and that's what we need. Because the anointing of the world, it's everywhere. You go, in the, you go through the stores, you, you peruse your phone, that anointing is there. I need this. I need that distracts us. If you think, I don't have time for God. We think we don't have time to do this. Well, how can I do it, Brother Rep? I'd say, take, on, take a look on your phone. There's usually a screen time app. They say, how much time do I spend on my phone? If you're talking three or four hours, try just giving 10% of that. <laughs> because we've got that, 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 that time that we spend on our screen, that's usually disposable time, where you could be doing something else, but you're just vegging. Just give a little bit of that time because you think, I don't have time. Check how much time you actually have on your app. It'll tell you how much time you actually have. And there's probably something better we can do with that time by listing. God has described our day with such clarity. And the devil has pushed that aside, getting us to push that aside. Maybe our last slide, sorry. What's the, uh, what's the solution 2 Corinthians 3.18, we all with open face, beholding as in the glass the glory of the Lord. As we behold the glory of God, we're changed into that same image from glory to glory. Get the true, accurate image of God before you. Look at him. Next slide. And that'll tell you who you're supposed to be. Who are you supposed to be? I think, I can't do it. I'm a sorry excuse for a Christian. But if you start looking in God's word, his word will tell you what you're going to be, where you're supposed to be, who your daddy is. That's where you need to go. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you very much, Lord, for For your word, Father, I thank you, Lord, that you've given us exactly what we need. Lord, I thank you for a message that goes and and wakes the sleeping person up that says, the bridegroom's coming. Go out to meet him. Go out to meet him. The bridegroom's coming. And sometimes we can just roll over and look at our phone and see what's going on. What's going on? I'm too tired to go out to meet him. No, the bridegroom's coming. Go out to meet him. Lord, I pray, O oh Father, that you would shake us also. Wake us, Lord, that we may see where we are. Paul said the last days won't come upon you except unless this, this thing happens first. Or someone's going to be set up in the temple of God calling himself as though he were God, even though he's not. And we see that happening. Check. Or we see these things happening around us. We see you being pushed out. I mean, there in the Laodicean church age, Brother Bradham said, look, Christ is on the outside of the church. And if we look at the doctrine of moralistic, therapeutic deism that's preached and believed by many Christians today, you're not in it. You're outside that church, knocking to get in. Lord, I pray, O oh Father, that you would anoint our, our eyes with eyes out. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take time each day to spend with you because my the atmosphere of the world is just like a poison gas. You can go into your house and get a gas leak. You won't realize it. You'll be affected by it. You'll be sickened by it. Help us, Lord, to have our eyes anointed each and every day, Lord, breathing the, the pure air of your word, O oh God. Lord, I pray that when we do that, we may not even understand everything we listen to. Oh, I've heard this again. I've heard this sermon so many times. He's telling this story again. I don't care because there's a spirit with it. God is moving with that. There's an anointing upon it. I want that anointing. He says, anoint your eyes with eyes. Have. That anointing is available. 
And I just want to say, if there's anybody that says, Lord, Brother pray for me. I need that. I need that anointing upon my eyes. Raise your hand. I'll pray for you. Because I've had a hard time before in the past. I've had a hard time accepting the message because it seems so hard and rough sometimes. I understand that. But that's what we need. Help me to accept what God's given. Yes, I'll pray for you on that. I know what you're saying. Lord, I thank you for each heart, Lord, who's sensitive and open. Lord, I pray that you'd move, and that, Lord, as we take a step toward you, your word says you will take a step toward us. And we can't even take a step toward you without you pulling on our heart first. It all starts with you. If you're here today, God's working on your heart. It's God, you can't have come to church without God working and pulling you in some way. Recognize that you are a daughter of God. You're a child of God. God has a plan for your life wonder who am I I'm so confused look on the Word of God because that is the only true accurate image of who we are I pray oh God you'd help us to stare into that gaze upon it that we might be changed more and more into your image each and every day oh God bless each heart I pray in Jesus name amen open my eyes Lord we want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, to say that we Have a song. Do you have a song?